There's just a couple things I want to say about that video that we just watched just to get us going. One, anyone can share the gospel. Did you notice the kids that were in there? I love that right there. That got me fired up. Anyone can share the gospel. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have been saved, if you have gone from brokenness back into God's design because of what he did for you on the cross, you have a story to tell, you know the truth, and you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a world that's in desperate need of it. Another thing that I noticed in that video, did not only can anybody share the gospel, but did you see how terrible some of those drawings were? Anyone can share the gospel. I'll put, I can't even barely draw stick figures. I can't even draw them straight. It's terrible. And uh, there's that one guy's drawing was really not even that good. It's not about the drawing, honestly. It's not even about the three circles necessarily. It's a wonderful tool. The whole point of why we've been talking about this every week is, number one, it fits perfectly with where we're at in the book of Romans. And number two, it's exactly what we should be doing as believers. We should be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is good news. The gospel is good news. I, I love the questions that, that wrap that up. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be in brokenness? Or do you want to be in God's design, in the center of God's will? Where do you want to be for eternity? And I love the last question. Is there anything stopping you? Unfortunately, for a lot of people, there are things that still stop them. And there are roadblocks that they run into. But the reality is when we see who we truly are and we see God's love for us and we see what he did for us unconditionally on the cross, there ought to be nothing that stops us from putting our faith and trust in Jesus as our Savior and having our life turned completely upside down. And the entire point of all of this is just to challenge us and to remind us to share the gospel. You remember where we ended last week in Romans chapter 10? I know that was a whole week ago. Anybody remember what you did yesterday? Okay. Listen, last week we ended with Romans 10, 15, which says, How beautiful are the feet of them that bring the gospel of peace, that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Never stop being amazed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there is a world that if they hear the truth and are presented with the truth, they will believe. And there are many that will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have their life forever changed. And that leads me to the title of our message this morning, which is simply this, Undone by God's goodness. Undone by God's goodness. I was going back and forth on titles of the message and I was putting together the order of service and looking at some of the songs that, that um, Vicky had sent me for this week. And this one, the title of the message ended up being inspired by that song that we just got done singing. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. And then everybody, if you remember that last line, I've got Jesus, how could I want more? Let's say that again. I've got Jesus, how could I want more? Man, are you undone by God's mercy? Are you undone by God's goodness? Man, we are sinners that have been saved by the amazing grace of God. I was talking to uh, Greg Pryor this past week. We were talking on the phone and somehow in the course of our conversation, the three circles came up and his connection class came up and he was talking about how the question was asked in their connect group about which one of the three circles maybe is the hardest one to explain or the hardest one to get people to understand. And Greg said in his mind, he went straight to God's design. And as soon as he said that, I have to be honest, I can't remember what else he said because my wheels started turning right there and I started going to where I was headed with the message this morning. But when you think about God's design, I think that is, it is hard for people to fully grasp that. We, we understand we're broken. I don't have a hard time convincing people that we're broken. Everybody understands we are broken people. We are sinners. And the gospel, I mean, the fact that we need a savior in a lot of ways it makes sense, but you know what's hard to fully grasp, and you know where I think what holds us back is, is God's design. I think people can understand that we should fear God if there's a creator of the universe, and if he is holy and righteous and we sin against him, I think there's a lot of fear of God. I think there's a lot of a, a, a dread and maybe even a, maybe even a dislike about who God is because he is holy and because he is righteous. And you know what I believe we miss, though, out of all of that? how good he is. God's design, he created us 
for fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. He created us with a, for a relationship with him. And you know what God wants to do with your life? He wants to bless you in unbelievable ways. At the end of our passage today, we're gonna talk about the riches of his grace. You know what? God wants to give you the desires of your heart. He wants to do exceeding abundantly above anything that you could ever ask or think. There is no better life. There is no better hope. There is no better relationship than the one that God has for you and the one that you can have through Jesus Christ. That is God's design. And yet we still run to the brokenness of the world over and over and over again. We need to be undone by God's goodness. Here we are in Romans chapter 9 through 11. We're actually in chapter 10. We're getting into chapter 11. We'll have one more week in this particular series, and then we're going to wrap it up. But Romans 9 through 11 is specifically written to the Jews, and it's about the Jews. All right, so you might be wondering, well, why does this matter to us today? All right, if it's written to the Jewish people in Paul's day, and if it's written about the Jews, what in the world does that have to do with us? It has everything to do with us, because the goodness of God is seen all over the nation of Israel. Wrap your mind around this for a second. God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, We disobeyed him, we rejected him, and yet we stumbled into sin. And in in spite of all of that, he loved us and he intervened in human history. And he selected a very special group of people based on no merit of their own. He intervened and he chose the nation of Israel and he has worked in them and through them and is still working in and through them to show the world who he is. Through the nation of Israel, you know what we learn? we learn about who God is. Through the nation of Israel, we see God. The fact that the nation of Israel is in existence today is proof that there is a God. Y'all understand that? I saw this incredible thing last night. I was trying to watch, watching some different videos, just seeing if there was anything that I might want to show, but I saw this and it just really hit me. The nation of Israel is about the size of the state of New Jersey. And the Middle East is about the size of the state of the United States of America. So imagine all the other 49 states not liking the nation of Israel, wanting Israel destroyed, and their biggest complaint about the nation of Israel is that they have way too much land. We're talking about the state of New Jersey. And in spite of all of that opposition and in spite of everything that is coming after them and all that's attacking them, the nation of Israel still exists today by God's divine grace and by God's divine power. And through them, he's showing the world who he is. There are all kinds of things I could say about how we can see God through the nation of Israel. I'll just say one more. He's preserved his people. He has preserved his people for almost 2000, from 8070 to the 1940s, the nation of Israel ceased to exist as a nation. They were dispersed throughout the entire world. Do you ever hear of Russian Philistines? Do you ever hear of uh, Mexican Philistines or whatever the case may be? No, you don't hear of these other nations that were in the Bible that have been dispersed, that have completely disappeared, but you do hear of Russian Jews and American Jews and European Jews and Jews that have been dispersed throughout the entire world. Do you know that it only takes typically five generations for a dispersed group, for their language to disappear, their customs to disappear, their culture to disappear. But in spite of all of that, over the course of around 1900 years, the nation of Israel was preserved and they came back to their homeland and the Hebrew language, which should have been a dead language, came back. And now 50% of the Jews in all of the world have gone back to their homeland because make no mistake about it, God is doing something special through the nation of Israel. Can I get an amen to that this morning? Okay, so we see God through Israel. You know what else we see through Israel? We see our own struggles through Israel. Any of you have any struggles? You know what I see? I see my self-righteous, condemning nature, because when I think about the nation of Israel, I think about the group that left the promised land and came out of, uh, not left the promised land, they came out of the land of Egypt And they came into the promised land. And I think about those people, and I think there was not another group of people that had more opportunities to see how real and how big and how powerful God is. I mean, they saw the 10 plagues. They saw the Red Sea parted. They were fed with manna every single day. They had water come out of a rock. They had quail. They had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I mean, you want to think about all the things that they had. And they still didn't make it into the promised land because they didn't believe God. And I'm like, 
how in the world can you be so blind and deaf and dumb? I mean, <laughs> seriously. But yet, how many times do we find ourselves backed into a corner and we doubt God and his goodness and his faithfulness? He's just as alive today. He is just on full, as on full display today as he has ever been. Again, look no further than the nation of Israel. You will see God's power and you will see our own struggles as we go in and out of our faithfulness and our relationship with God, and yet he is still good, and he is still kind, and he is still loving. Inside the nation of Israel, we see God's wonderful plan for salvation, and there's a whole lot that we can learn and that we need to soak up from that. So y'all ready to dive right in? All right, here we go. Number one, God is patiently calling. God is patiently calling. Look at verse 16. The Bible says here in verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Now this is coming right off the heels of verse 15. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of good, uh, the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. To obey the gospel means that you repent and believe. You find out that you are a broken sinner. You find out that Jesus Christ went to a cross to die for your sins. And if you obey the gospel, you repent and you believe the truth of the gospel. And in spite of everything that they had heard, <laughs> and this is coupled with the fact that God sent his very own son and they crucified him. And the very people that crucified him, Paul's now writing to just a number of years later. And he's saying, hey, you can still be saved even though you rejected him, and even though you killed him. He loves you and he died for you. And you can put your faith and trust in him and you can be saved. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. It's terrible. Look what he says next. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? This goes all the way back to Isaiah 53, verse 1. For who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before them as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. And when we shall behold him, there is no form nor comeliness, and there is no beauty that we should desire him. Isaiah is complaining before God, and he's saying, God... You've sent me to these people, and I'm trying to tell them about who you are, and I'm trying to tell them about how good you are, but they're not believing me. And then when Jesus himself showed up, they still didn't believe him because he was not the king and the savior that they thought he would be. He was just a humble servant, and he did not come with any majesty, and he did not come in all of his glory. He came as an ordinary human being in the form of a servant, and because of that, he was despised and rejected, he was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And he went to that cross and he died so that we could be saved. Israel rejected Jesus. Now, there's two possible reasons why. Why, why did they reject Jesus? Was it because they didn't hear? Look at what it says in verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. Okay, so Paul goes back to this very, we talked about this last week. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You cannot have faith unless a message is delivered and heard and then believed. Okay, so faith comes by hearing. And so then Paul says, well, have they not heard? And he said, no, they've heard. And he quotes from Psalm 19 Verse three, you know what Psalm 19 is all about? Psalm 19 is all about natural revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God. Man, you want proof that God is real? Look at the sun and the moon and the stars. Look at the design and the intelligence of our creation. If you want to believe that a bunch of molecules were just floating around in space, crashed together, and all of a sudden we have the amazing design that we have, help yourself. That takes a whole lot more faith than an intelligent designer and an intelligent creator every single day, proving over and over again that he is faithful. And by the way, why do you think there are so many people in the world that believe in some sort of a God or some sort of a religion? Why do you think atheists have to spend their life proving that there isn't a God or agnostics have to convince themselves there is no God because there is and the heavens declared and every day he shouts loud and clear there is a creator and there's something bigger and greater than you so what Paul's doing is he's now comparing the gospel to that just like the heavens 
and creation declares that there's a creator, the gospel is being declared in the same way. By the way, everywhere that there was a Jew, the gospel was being spread. They were hearing about Jesus. They were hearing about the Messiah and it was being taken to the ends of the earth and the earth was being turned upside down because of the truth of the gospel. Oh, believe me, they heard. They heard who Jesus was. There's no excuse. Well, then he says in verse 19, he says, but I say, did not Israel know? Well, if they heard, I mean, maybe, maybe they didn't know. Maybe they didn't fully understand. Maybe they didn't comprehend. And look what he says. First, but I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. Oh, no. Paul says, no, that you know. 1,500 years earlier, right before Moses died, he gathers all the people together. And he says, if you reject God and if you get rebellious against him and if you put other gods before you and you don't follow him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then there's going to come a day where God may put you off to the side. And he's going to take a group of people that were no people. He was going to take a nation that was no nation. And he's going to start pouring out all of his blessings on them to provoke you to jealousy so that you will wake up. And by the way, that's exactly what's happening now. This was prophesied about. You know the book of Deuteronomy. You know your law. You understand. You've heard. You just don't want to believe. God is patiently calling. Look at these next verses, and here's the practical application. Accept the invitation. Accept the invitation. Look at verse 20. I love this verse. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. You know what's amazing? Is that God came to you when we weren't looking for him. Let me just look at that again. I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. All right, I'm going to do a poll. I need everybody looking up here. Okay, I'm going to ask you these questions. When I ask you your category, you raise your hand. Okay, so how many of you had the opportunity to to be born into a Christian home and you got saved at a young age? How many? Holy cow. Look at those hands. That is magnificent right there. Okay, so you being born into a Christian home, did that have anything to do with you? Absolutely not. And you know what? The fact that you were able to be born into a home where you heard the truth and where you were able to trust Jesus as your savior at a young age had nothing to do. You were just a kid. You were just living your best life, sucking your thumb, stealing your brother's toys, okay? That's it. And yet God showed up and he gave us the truth in Sunday school and in the nursery and we believed and it had absolutely nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with God. You understand? He sought us. All right, how many of you got saved because you got really, really, really broken and you recognize that you were in desperate need of a savior. How many people like that in here later in life? Oh, I see those hands all over. You know what you did? You walked away from God, lived rebellious of God your entire life and you found yourself at the depths of despair with no way out and you know who showed up? It wasn't you necessarily that said, I need God. God showed up and started working in your heart saying, you need God, you need God. He pursued you even though you ran as hard and as far and as fast away from him as you could. He showed up and he saved you to God be the glory. All right, now how many of you got saved because of a family member? Maybe you're out there just living your best life. You weren't necessarily broken. You didn't grow up in a Christian home, but somebody in your family got saved and they started telling you about it. You started asking questions and then the next thing you know, you are now a child of God and your life has been forever changed. Anybody like that in here? Okay, a few. Look at that. Did you have anything to do with that? No, you're just living your best life and yet God uses somebody else's transformation and he pursues you through them through the gospel being shared and you get saved. How about one more? Let's do this one. Anybody in here have somebody show up at your house randomly? You're just minding your own business. Someone knocks on the door, or maybe you're at Walmart and they give you a track or something. You're not even necessarily thinking about God or who he is, and bam, someone shows up, and now you are a child of God because they shared the gospel with you. Anybody like that in here? Right there, Brother Skipper. I'm also thinking of you guys right back here. Um, Your name's just, your last name's just slipped my mind. Sorcia, what is your mom and dad's last name? They're sitting right there. I knew that. That's what happens to me up here on Sunday mornings. Like, I go to Covington's Coffee all the time. What in the world is wrong with me? My brain just went blank. I'm not even that old yet. I know the Covingtons had someone knock on their door. Listen, 
God pursues us. Do you understand? It has nothing to do with us. And maybe you're here this morning and you're just here because someone invited you and you're just rocking along, living your best life. God is calling you. You are broken and you need a savior and Jesus is the answer. Don't just dismiss him. Don't just ignore him. Pay attention and accept the invitation because he's got something good and wonderful for you that can turn your life upside down. All right, and then look at verse 21. But to Israel, he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. This is where I got God is patiently calling. All day long. For hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years, where Israel as a whole despised the prophets, despised the truth, despised Jesus Christ himself. Do you understand that God sent his only begotten son and all day long his hands are stretched forth to a disobedient and obstinate, hard-hearted people and he's saying, I still love you. I'm still your father. I still care. Come on, accept the invitation. All you gotta do is repent. All you gotta do is believe and I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. I'm here. Here, that's who our God is. Wow. God is patiently calling, accept the invitation. Secondly, God is forever faithful. We're going to try to go through this a little bit quicker. Look at verse 1 of chapter 11. All right. He says, I say then. Everybody read that question out loud with me. Help me out here. Hath God cast away his people? And what is the answer? Everybody out loud, those next two words. God forbid. There's no such thing as replacement theology. God has not cast away the children of Israel to replace them with the church. The church is now the vehicle that God's using, but he's not done with the nation of Israel. They still are in existence today. There's still big things coming and happening, all right? So he gives some proofs for this. He defends his argument. Look what he says. First is personal evidence. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Hello, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And I'm saved. And by the way, I was one of the hardest, most obstinate rejectors of Jesus. And he met me in a glorious way. And by the way, Paul is a picture of what is going to happen someday in the future. Israel as a whole has rejected him. But God in a miraculous way will open their eyes. And hard-hearted Israel will repent and believe and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Paul's a picture of that. So there's some personal evidence here. There's also theological evidence. Look at verse 2. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. I love that word, foreknow. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. But he chose and picked and loved Israel long before they ever knew they were chosen and picked and loved by God. And you know what he did? He chose them out of all the people of the earth, even though they were no people themselves. He chose Abraham, who was worshiping other gods, an idolater. And he saved him and he called him and he chose him and he made a covenant with them. And that covenant was unconditional and it didn't matter how unfaithful or adulterous the nation of Israel is. Oh no, I am going to be forever faithful. That's the whole point here. God is forever faithful. I've made a covenant with them. These are his people who he foreknew. He loves them. He cares about them and nothing is ever going to change that. Then there's biblical evidence. Look at the end of verse 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. And then he says, What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. I got to tell you this story right here. Elijah lived at one of the most horrible times in the nation of Israel. I mean, you want to talk about idolatry and sin and wickedness? It was there. And it felt like no one believed in God. Here's what Elijah did. Elisha calls the prophets of Baal to a showdown. They all come up to Mount Carmel, 400, um, 400 prophets of Baal, one prophet of God, Elijah. And a bunch of people show up and they're watching this showdown and he takes an altar and he digs a trench around it and they dump all kinds of water all over the altar so that there's no way humanly it could ever get lit. And he tells the prophets of Baal, all right, if Baal's real, Pray to your God and get him to send down fire from heaven. All day long, those jokers out there, they prayed, they chanted, they cut themselves. You want to talk about how far we can go in our blindness? 
They cut themselves. They they started bleeding. They put themselves through pain, hoping that their God would hear them. And after hour, after hour, after hour, guess what? Their God never heard and the fire never showed up. And it was Elijah's turn and the day was about to end. And he prayed and he said, God, show everybody who you are. And bam, fire out of heaven, consumes the whole altar. And he says, kill these prophets of Baal, turn your lives back to God. And Elijah's living his best life now, man. You want to talk about a revival and a powerful moment. Ahab's there. He takes off in his chariot. Elijah goes off to the side and he prays seven times for rain. There'd been a drought for three years. All of a sudden, a little cloud shows up about the size of a fist. And the next thing you know, it's a torrential downpour and the drought is over. And Elijah knew that God answered. So he took off running and he ran 15 miles back to Jezreel faster than Elijah went. I mean, and then Ahab went in his chariot and he shows up and he finds out that Jezebel still wants him dead. He's like, are you kidding me? God just sent fire down out of heaven. The clouds, it's raining. There's going to be an abundance. The the drought is over. You still want me dead? And you know what he did? He went out and had the biggest pity party you could ever possibly imagine in his life to the point where he almost died. And God shows up to him and, and he's crying and he's saying, God, I'm the only one out of everybody. I'm the only one. No one else loves you. No one else cares. And God says, Elijah, shut your mouth. There are 7,000 prophets that have not bowed their knee to Baal. I have reserved a remnant. And it wasn't about keeping them alive. It was about keeping them faithful because God is forever faithful. And it doesn't matter how dark and how dreary and how desperate it gets. You are never alone. There is a remnant because God is forever faithful. And guess what? There was a present remnant even. Look at what he says next. Verse five, even so then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. (laughs) There's a present remnant that is at work. This was great. When Jesus died on the cross, there's about 120 people that went into an upper room after he ascended up into heaven. Okay, he died, he rose again, 120 people waiting. Holy Ghost shows up. They preach on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people get saved. You go to Acts chapter 4, 5,000 people get saved. By the time you get to Acts chapter 21, Paul shows up in Jerusalem. James meets them there, and he says, Paul, many thousands Many thousands of people have trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God was doing a work amongst his people even at that day. He would not cast them off. No, there was a remnant. There was true Israel, Israel that had put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ that was being for saved, and God was preserving his people. God's not cast away his people. God's forever faithful. So here's the practical application. Test and taste his grace. At the end of verse 5, he said, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And then in verse 6, he says, and if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You know what he's saying? The election. The people that God chose to be saved. The people that God chose to be his remnant. It was by grace. It had nothing to do with them. If it had anything to do with them, it would no longer be grace. It had everything to do with God. You might be sitting here and say, how do I know if I'm elect? How do I know if God's chosen me? If you want God's grace, and if you realize that there's nothing you can do to earn it, you just believe in it and you trust it, then you are part of the elect. You are one of God's chosen. He loves you. He cares about you. So test and taste his grace. I don't know about you, but I I certainly test God's grace quite a bit. I may have tested it yesterday at a basketball game, but I'm not the only one. I'll call out other people in here. I saw and heard you too. (laughs) No, I'm not. That's wrong. Okay. (sighs) I always feel so dumb when I go home, but anyway, I'm working on that. I'm a work in progress. Anybody else mess up in here this week? Anybody mess up? Come on, be honest, you liars. Come on, get down. Just, wow, I can't believe I just got I'm calling you all liars today. We're all messed up. I'm not telling us to test his grace in the sense of, let's see how wide and how far and how big this goes, and let's live our best lives and live under grace. That's not it at all. But when you mess up, test his grace. Humble yourself. Ask him for forgiveness right away. And guess what? He'll meet you with forgiveness because he's a good God. Taste his grace. I'm going to grab this stool here for a second. I was thinking a lot about this this morning. One of my, I know this is weird, but I brought a LaCroix with me. 
seltzer water. Anybody like seltzer water? I'm weird. I like it, okay? I know. It's not sweet tea, whatever. I learned to like this a long time ago, but it's now one of my favorite things. I don't drink a lot of these, but I'll tell you what, sometimes in the middle of the day or at night after a long day, there's nothing like, and just don't think about the seltzer water, okay? This is what I like personally. Just think about whatever like your favorite drink is, whatever. You know, you ever just sit down, it's been a long day, and just in that moment, man, you just like open that thing up and you're like, you ever do that? Am I the only one? I just dro- drooled, oh my goodness, I spilled it all down my shirt. I'm a complete mess, I understand. And throughout every day, there's just those moments of just like, it's refreshing. And I bring this out, I know it's a silly illustration, but just to say, when we sit in God's grace, that, that, do you ever just sit and taste his grace? I gotta tell you, th- this church was a gigantic blessing to us. Last week, you totally blew our minds when, you, when I found out you were giving us $40,000 to get a new vehicle, and because of your goodness and your grace, I was like a little kid at Christmas time, man. I had that money was burning a hole in my pocket. I got shopping right away Sunday night, and by Tuesday, we had a new car. Go ahead and put the picture up. You guys helped us buy a Toyota Highlander right there. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Honestly, I... Every single time, I promise you this, every single time I get in that vehicle and turn it on, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to taste God's grace. Because God used his people to provide for a need in an unbelievable way. And every time I get in that car, I hope before God, and I promise I want to sit there and just thank God and never, ever take it for granted. But you know what? That's not really necessarily, yeah, that is a, a taste of God's grace. God will provide. He does all kinds of extra little things for us in our life all along the way. But I'll tell you what, this week was not without its difficulties. There's some challenges and things that came up. And on Wednesday, right before I came down here to do, my devo- uh, do the Bible lesson from Psalm 7, the very first few words of Psalm 7, David's in deep emotional stress, and he says, Oh, Lord, my God. Lord is Jehovah. It's the personal name of God. The first time that he introduced himself as Lord, it was to Moses in a burning bush. And that bush is on fire. And man, God's talking to Moses and he says, I want you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses says, well, who should I tell him is sending me? And he just said, I am that I am. Like, duh, I'm in a burning bush right now talking to you. I am God. I am Jehovah. I am Lord. It's his personal name. But he says, oh, Lord, my God, my God is Elohim. Elohim is the word that shows up in the beginning. God, the creator, a God of all power, a God who is more than sufficient. And he gets on his face before God in deep emotional stress. And he says, oh, Lord, you're my personal God. You're my savior. My God, you are powerful and you are creator. And you're able to intervene and you're able to do things that I'm not capable of doing in and of myself. And can I tell you, in that moment right there, you want to know what tasting God's grace is like? That's what God's grace is all about because he'll calm you. He'll set you at ease. He'll remind you over and over again that I am bigger. I am greater. I've got all things under control. That's who our God is. He is forever faithful. And it's because of his unmerited favor. It's because of his grace. It's because of his goodness. And we don't deserve a single ounce of it. But every day, if we'll run to him and if we'll humble ourselves and if we'll just sit, you can taste that grace. You can taste it through his word. He wants to be so real in your life. And I beg of you, taste his grace. I got one more point that I've got to finish up in the next six minutes. God is astonishingly ruling. God is astonishingly ruling. I sent that to Elena. I said, is that correct grammar? And she said, that's a lot. And I said, good. That's exactly what I want it to be. All right, I'm going to go through this quick, okay? So follow along, and I'm going to get some boys up here to help me with an illustration. Look at verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Here's his conclusion on the matter, okay? He says, what then? Israel's not obtained the election, okay? So what Israel wanted more than anything was the righteousness of God. They loved being God's chosen people, but they didn't really want God. They wanted their own righteousness. And so what they sought so hard, what they were so desperate for, they never really got. But then here's the Gentiles over on the other side, and what they weren't looking for, they got. God showed up to them and gave them, I mean, they heard about Jesus. They're like, 
yeah, I'm broken. And I know I can't save myself, but he died for me. Yeah, I want God's design. And they trusted in him, but yet Israel rejected him. And look what happens as a result. The rest were blinded. He hardened them. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. And to this day, there's a mystery here. It's from Isaiah. God hardened Israel. It was only after Israel hardened themselves. I mean, he sent prophet after prophet. And even here, these people, I mean, he sent Jesus, his son. They crucified him. And yet he's still offering them grace and forgiveness. But they're still rejecting them. So at some point, if we harden our hearts, then God hardens us. And he begins to remove that grace from our lives. And he just lets us live how we want. And we get harder and more obstinate. We harden ourselves. And sometimes God steps in and he hardens as well. There's a mystery about how those two things work. But God is sovereign. We have a free will. And that's what's happening and what's taking place here. And so look what he says in verse 9. And David said, saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Psalm 63 is where this comes from. In Psalm 63, Israel was a persecuted people and they're praying that God would turn the tables. That the people that were persecuting would feel persecuted. But now God's turned the tables on them and said, you once we're the persecuted people, but now you're doing the persecuting, and I'm going to turn the tables on you. And the imagery there is what was once a picture of stability, like their house and their table and their food, a position of strength and stability, now all of a sudden is a snare and a trap. And he says, let their backs be bent always. Man, let them feel the fear and the oppression that comes with rejecting God. Because believe me, when you reject God, you will start reaping what you want in life, but so will the burdens. They'll start coming. He says, let their backs be bent always. So this is what he says to his people, his covenant people, his chosen people. You've rejected me as a whole, so I'm going to turn the tables on you. And then he says in verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Everybody, what's those next two words out loud? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. All right, you two boys that I asked earlier, come up here and help me out, okay? Give these guys a warm welcome as they come up on the stage. All right, tell everybody your name. I'm Caleb. This is Caleb. Say hi to Caleb, everybody. Hi. And this is, tell everybody your name. I'm Gideon. Caleb and Gideon, okay? Gideon, perfect, man. I was going to make, well, Caleb, these are both good Israelite names, man. Gideon had more issues, okay? Caleb, he's better. Come on, I like him. You're going to be the Gentiles. You stay right here. Gideon is going to represent the nation of Israel, okay? And the whole time the nation of Israel has been in existence, man, you might look at them and you might not think there's anything great or fantastic about Gideon, although I do, Gideon. I think you're a wonderful young man, okay? This guy's awesome. You might think he's just an ordinary young man, right? But when you start reading the Bible and you start looking at the nation, I've confessed before to you before that I get jealous sometimes that I'm not a Jew. I'm like, man, they're God's chosen people. I want to be one of God's chosen people. They're special above all the people of the earth. Well, when you start reading the Bible and you start looking at Gideon, you start thinking about the nation of Israel even to this day. They are God's chosen people. And God used them to show the world that who he is, to provoke us to jealousy so that when we look at all the ways that God blessed Israel, we say, I want God. I want the God of Israel. So I'm going to put my faith in him. And through the Old Testament, you have people like Rahab and uh, Ruth and people like that that were Moabites, that were Gentiles, and they put their faith and trust in Jesus, okay? So Gideon represents Israel. Jesus comes to Gideon. He says, Gideon, I'm the Messiah, man. And Gideon looks at me and says, you're just a regular old person. You're a humble servant. And I said, no, more than you need a conquering king, Gideon, you need a savior. You need to repent and believe. And Gideon says, no, I don't like this guy. And he puts Jesus Christ on the cross. And so now what God does is, is he comes and he says, okay, I'm putting you to the side. And he says to Paul, who's the apostle to the Gentiles, he says, go to the Gentiles. By the way, in the Bible, there's two groups of people. There's Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't matter. There's, that's it. You're either one of God's people or you're not one of God's people. That's the bottom line. And so he goes to the Gentiles and he's like, hey, they didn't want me. But listen, you're broken and you need a savior. And Gideon's, I mean, Caleb's like, you're right. I need a savior. I wasn't even looking for him, but wow, he's completely changed my life. And so you know what God does? Come here, Caleb. Man, once you get saved, he starts pouring out. Did you notice the riches 
in verse 11 and 12, I mean, he says, their falls come to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, man, he's like, dude, I'm going to give you a crown. You are a joint heir with Jesus. You are my child. How about this, man? You need some new clothes. You need the righteousness of Jesus. Slide this on right here. Man, you were dirty and broken, but now I'm going to give you the righteousness of Jesus. Not only that, man, I'm going to give you a fresh new perspective of life. Check out this new outlook. Rose-colored glasses. Man, I live under grace. I'm testing and tasting the grace. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I got strength. I got hope. I got everything I need for whatever situation I find myself in life. Man, God's a provider. Check this out. The bag of gold. But you know what? He owns everything. Sometimes he just gives us a little nugget at a time, and that's fine because he promises to meet every single one of our needs. But he's got the whole bag. And when you need it, he's going to provide, okay? So, man, hooking you up with that. And then he's giving you this book right here. And by the way, more and more in life, I want you to realize, don't take this book for granted. This is the secret to it all. This is the key to success. You want to taste his grace? Open this book up. This book is alive. And one of the best ways I love to look at it, it's a treasure map, man. This is a treasure map. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that can be desired are not to be compared to that. In that book is wisdom. And if you obey it and if you follow it, God will lead you and guide you and direct you. And all of a sudden, Gideon is over here looking at Caleb, and he's like, that's not fair. Check it out, man. Look at all that he's got. And to people that are lost, they're like, sometimes they think it just sounds and looks weird. The righteousness of Jesus, a different perspective. Listen, he don't look weird. And by the way, God doesn't want us to look weird either, okay? But he does want us to be different and to stand out. And you know what he's doing? He used Gideon to provoke us to jealousy so that we would put our faith and trust in him. But Gideon didn't want anything to do with Jesus. So Jesus says, I'm going to go to the Gentiles and I'm going to offer myself to him. And now he's using Caleb to provoke Gideon to jealousy. So Gideon will say, look at what you've rejected. Look at what you're missing out on. You're missing out on everything that comes with being a child of God. And guess what? When Israel repents, which they will one day, and God's going to come back and he's going to establish his throne and he's going to rule and reign in Israel forever, Gideon's going to repent and he's going to put his faith and trust in Jesus and the fullness of it all is going to come together. That's who our God is. And he is astonishingly ruling. Don't for a second think that he's done with the nation of Israel. Oh, he's far from done. He's provoking them to jealousy. And by the way, don't you dare, don't miss out on the invitation that God's offering to all of you to put your faith and trust in him. Because he wants to pour out the riches of the goodness of his grace in your life. And he's using you to draw other people to himself.